I mean, so obviously that has a huge impact on your songwriting. <laughs> we'll go back to I want to start with this record. Okay. This new record is beautiful. Thanks. It's really beautiful. And as I understand it, it's them over there. Yeah. Who, they made they made me do it. Is that hotel room story true? Is that real? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah. So yeah, we have pictures of them. Yeah, the picture of them, they locked yeah. it. Was, it was the Omni connected to the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah. They knew I, I liked it. I can't wait to get a visitor in town so I can go down to the Country Hall of Fame. Right. I made an excuse to go down there. And Do you walk by your boots and go, those are my boots? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah I go, I, I never get my good boots. That's right. I'm still, I'm still working. You know? <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't mean, got cobwebs on me yet. <laughs> so, uh, now I get my, this, this, the coat that doesn't fit me and the yeah. boots I hardly wear. But uh, uh, they put me uh, in the Omni there in Nashville for a week. I checked in with uh, 11 boxes of unfinished lyrics, three guitars and a ukulele. And I slept all day, ordered room service at three in the morning, rode at night, went over the Hall of Fame when things were going slow. Yeah. You know. Uh, go buy stuff in the gift shop and then come back to my room and go through those lyrics again. And I came out with 10 songs all put together, you know. Mm -hmm. I wrote two or three new ones that week. The rest of my piece together from stuff I've been meaning to finish. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I would have had 10 songs I was proud of. But I didn't think they had anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't see any connection. But it all seems to work. And I told Fiona, Fiona says, don't you see that you're, she says, these songs are about love and mortality, and yeah. I said, this is ain't Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> you know, this is, these are ten John Prine songs. Right. So I went in with that attitude, but I was proud of the songs, and I was really surprised how pretty they came out. You know, on the other end. Were you surprised by the reaction you got? Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I didn't put a record out in thirteen years, so I don't know. I'm not sure what people are expecting or not expecting. I love when you were putting out records where you were covering great female singers and songwriters, right? So I thought, no one does that. Like, right. nobody does that. And you, and then suddenly we hear that, oh, there's another batch of songs. And I wondered, in that time off, was it confidence that you didn't have? Was it a desire that you didn't have? What was no, the way? things were going really good. <laughs> you just, and I didn't want to screw it up. I I've mean, heard you I, say, I, like, I what keep, do you mean? Uh, I keep... Uh, uh, I go back and play the same cities, except my uh, um, the audience is Dublin. Yeah. Uh, it's people, it's young people that tell me that their parents, or in some cases their grandparents, like played their music in uh, on their car trips. Yeah. So the kids would learn the songs as like they were, you know, like they were nursery rhymes, and then they grow up and find out this guy really wrote them, yeah. and they come to my shows. So I'm getting. The old people that have been coming for years, and the younger ones, and then a lot of young uh, artists that have come along mention me mm -hmm. as an influence on their writing. So this is all stuff I don't, uh, you can't pay for. It. Right. <laughs> I mean, it just happened, you know. And uh, it, was, it was going so good, I thought, why should I make a record and screw this up? Because then you have to play, go to a concert, and play the new material. They right. don't want to hear the new material. Yeah. Right. You know, but we're playing every song off the new record, yeah. plus the old ones. So what, it, what, do you, what do you think that tells you about what the audience wants from you? I don't know, maybe the, it's, it's like I wrote a joke and they finally got it 45 years later. You know, they're like, they're, they're hitting their ribs and going, I get it now, yeah. you know? So like, uh, that's great, because I was thinking about slowing down. Yeah. Not quitting, but just, you know, the road will get you after a while. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how nice a hotel you stay in or any motor transportation. I hate going through airports. Yeah. I don't like a bus more than two days. Right. We just got a bus about two weeks ago for a weekend. Yeah. Man, there'll be another two years, ten years before I get on a bus. You know, I, I can't yeah. go sleep on a bus. No. no. You've also done that. You either party all night or right. and then you have to sleep for two days when you get to the next town. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy I have done that. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Did you find that over the 13 years that you had things to say? Things that you need, that you wanted to put out? Not really, no. <laughs> you know, but it was there. When, when, I, when I went back in the mine and put the shovel down, there was gold there in those hills. Did you wonder if you could do it? I did, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not, I, I don't know any more now than I did back in 19, late 60s when I started writing. Right. I, I might have thought I knew more than that, 
But I know now that I don't know anything about songwriting. It either comes or it doesn't. And I've been blessed to write some really good stuff. And if it, if the muse never came back again, that'd be okay by me. Yeah. You know, it's been a lot of time at my doorstep. Yeah. So and, uh, I got some really good songs I can lay back on, you know. Yeah. But it, it's good that I could come up with 10 more. It's kind of crazy, really, you know. Um, sure. As far as sales go, I'm like a 71-year-old pop sensation, you know. Because you got crazy. a chart. you got a chart record. I'm making Taylor Swift sweat, you know. <laughs> So. But good for you, someone has to tell right. you. Yeah, so, yeah, besides that, she probably looks good sweating. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is good, you know. The um, when, when you started to go through songs, when Fiona tells you that this is about love and mortality, are you feeling, are you seeing that then? Are you hearing that from another person's point? Oh, yeah. yeah, from other people's. You know, but they, I guess they think I'm, I'm dwelling on death's door yeah. or something like that. Well, you're 71, that's not old. Like, you're, you know, you're still young. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, unless I walk by a mirror, I'm 13. You know, I'm nine when I get up and 13 when I go to bed. Right. Well, although maybe because in the record you do talk about, you know, here's what's going to happen when I die. Like you Yeah, mean, well, yeah. it was actually, that song was based on, it was my own private happy hour song. Yeah. Like if I go like this and say I've been doing stuff all day that, that equals work, and I go, it's five o'clock, and I go, I go, we're going to have a cocktail with vodka and ginger ale. It's my little song on the way to, to fixing me a drink right. for the first drink of the day. And uh, and I just took that in the melody and extended it and thought, I gave up smoking the night before I had my surgery done. Right. Like, that's 1996. The night before, I mean, you took it right to the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I smoked from the... My, my father caught me smoking when I was 12. Right. He said, if I waited till I was 14, I could smoke all I wanted to. I got up at 4.30 a.m. on my 14th birthday and went to the gas station across the street and bought a pack of Herbert Charrington's. Jesus. Brought them back and I stood in front of the mirror and smoked till I looked cool. <laughs> you know, and once I looked cool, I did that. I smoked a pack a day for 40 years. That's insane, man. Yeah, but I missed it. You know, I, yeah. still, I, I, I gave up smoking, but when I see somebody walk outside a restaurant and fire up, I'll go stand next to him so I can get that Just initial get him blast. Yeah. That was like when I quit drugs. If I would go stand outside a Steve Miller concert, I could smell the weed. <laughs> right. <laughs> just smell I mean, so yeah. So I, I, did, I put that in the song. I'm going to smoke a cigarette nine miles long. Where could I do that? Heaven. Why would anybody mind smoking in heaven, you know? Um, so that's where I, I was just trying to picture what heaven was like. But again, you were just having some fun with it. Exactly. Right. I mean, if, if I'm going to go to heaven, I'm not going to wear a white robe and sing mediocre Christian songs, <laughs> you know? And if those people are there, I'm going to need a drink. That's right. You know? <laughs> well, it's like Willie singing about roll me up and smoke me yeah, like right. that, right? Exactly. It's about writing your own narrative. I, I'm hoping Willie's right next to me. I'm sure, <laughs> you know? I'm sure he will be. Yeah. I, want the, I want the hotel room next to Willie's. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you still think you're that, you know, we all do, you think you're a certain age, no matter how old you get, um, do you still feel like you're fresh as a songwriter, fresh in this business, and do you still feel like you would have been... Well, I you know, enjoy Chris performing yeah. more than ever. Yeah? Yeah, I really do. i got a great band now. I just... Got some great guys in the band. And yeah, because a lot of times it's just you and a guitar. Yeah. Right? I know, but I've I got a four piece band. Uh, yeah. And these guys are great. They wrap their music right around me. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's really good. You get that, that, that feeling, that vibrant feeling? Yeah. Them? Oh, no, I'm, I'm having a great time on stage. Right. Yeah. Are you surprised that you are at this stage? No. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I've always kind of enjoyed performing. Yeah. You know? So it's, that's where I make my living. Yeah. The yeah. studio is still a faraway place to me. You know, even though I had fun making this last record, the studio is not, I'm not one of those guys that go, uh, want to hang out in the studio and have a studio in my house and, yeah. you know, always create and stuff. I don't want to do that. I just want to come up with a song every once in a while, and go in and go, are we done yet? <laughs> you know? is, it, is it because if you have that distance from it, it maintains a kind of special place? It makes it fresh. Yeah. And for me, you know, if I was in there all the time, I don't want to create anything on a record that I can't recreate yeah. before an audience. Yeah. So simplicity is key, right? Right, yeah. The song is the boss. 
You know, I don't know where a song comes from, but if I get a hold of a pretty one, I don't want nobody messing up that. That's my that's my kid. Yeah. You know, and I don't want anybody messing it up. The song should dictate what needs to be there or doesn't need to be there. And that's what I like about Dave Cobb producing my last record. Right. He was very minimal about it. He never asked me to, to change anything. He'd ask the other musicians if we were going to play the song another time. He'd ask them to do something different. He never asked me to because I wrote the song. So right. here's the song, and he just dressed up the song and sent it to school. And, he, and, and so the assumption is that if you, however you played it out, that's how you intended it to be. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, it wasn't like, what do you think of this? Right. I said, this is the song. <laughs> I hit the ball and he put it over the fence. Yeah. Because so. yeah, if you overthink it, you can take away the, the, the spirit of the song? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's easy to do. I've been in situations like that. Anybody that's been in a studio can, has been in situations like that. And also they create something that they can't recreate on stage. So with, your, with the songs that you're, you know, especially your classic songs, are there ones <clears> that you hear it and think, I overthought that one. I didn't do that one right. I wish I had left this. Yeah, right. but the song was so strong, it made its way through. Right, yeah. It, it got, came out of the debris. You know, like other stuff landed on top of it. And See, I like that. People still a, heard the song. It cut through. And it's because it's almost like it is a muse in a way. It's like it's less about you. It's just if the song right. is there. It just, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is the power of a great melody and great lyrics, right? Yeah. It can make somebody who has no idea about your backstory feel connected to you. Right. Or connected to it. And the part I like about songwriting is when you write something really good and you're the only one on earth that knows about it. And before you don't sing it for anybody, I like to keep it for three or four days. So you have, so you just have it? Oh yeah, I just walk around the streets going, you don't know what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Which one have you done that with? Sam Stone. I kept that under wraps for about two weeks. I didn't play it for nobody. And um, You knew you had something there. Yeah, Jesus the Missing Years. I wouldn't sing that one for about a month to anybody. Really? I had to sell, sell it to myself, go, I sure like it, but are, are people going to think I'm crazy if I sing this? Right. Sabu visits the Twin Cities alone. So it was like, were people like Chris Christopherson <coughs> following you, trying to read your lips, just trying to see if they can pick up the melody you were singing to yourself? <laughs> no. I just saw Chris last yeah. week. Yeah. How's he doing? Really great. It yeah. was just great to see him. We reconnected on his bus, and yeah. I got up and sang three or four songs with him, and he's got Merle Haggard's band out, The Strangers. I hadn't seen those guys since the last time I saw Merle. And um, it was just really good yeah. seeing Chris and singing and everything, you know. He's still got that voice too, right? He does, good. man. Yeah. He's, he's got that presence too, yeah. I was once offered a role in a movie and I turned it down because I didn't have time to schedule, I just couldn't do it. And yeah. the di director called me and said, I know you don't have time, but just so you know, your part is right between Chris and Merle. You sure you don't want to do it? <laughs> and I said, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, I mean, Chris and you were like early days. You know, Chris is a big part of your story, Chris right? Chris helped me get yeah. my first uh, record contract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a camaraderie. I'm sure it I still mean, exists, but it really feels like it's something mythological back then. It, it is, and it was. I mean, when I first met Chris, I couldn't think of anybody on earth that I would have wanted to play my songs for uh, than Chris Christopherson. And Steve Goodman was the guy who made it happen. Right. Goodman was opening a show for Chris. and for three nights and on the other side of town. I was playing at the Earl of Old Town in Chicago. And every night, Chris and his band would tell Goodman how much they liked his songs and that he ought to think about making a record. And he'd go, you guys need to come across town and hear my buddy. That's all Goodman cared about. Yeah. You gotta come hear my buddy. You haven't heard nothing yet. You know. And they finally dragged him over there the last night Chris was 12 30 in the morning he didn't want to, he didn't want to come see some new kids yeah. singing songs he came over to hear me man and he asked me to sing our songs a second time and anything else i wrote he wanted to hear everything i ever wrote were you uh, a kid with a dream then only recently beforehand I, um i i wrote for since i was 14 for a hobby mm -hmm. that was my way to get away from the world just go write a song yeah. And six months before I met Christopherson, I was a mailman and singing two nights a week. So I was living the dream. I actually, when I quit the post office, I was making a thousand bucks a week in cash, singing three nights a week. That's actually pretty good. I slept, I slept all the, the rest of the week. 
sing three nights a week, which is what I love to do, is sing and right. play the guitar. And as far as I was in hog heaven, I mean, I didn't need a thousand bucks with four times what I was making every two weeks at the post office right. walking in the snow. Right. So I didn't have to weigh one against the other and go, should I walk in the snow or should I sing three nights a week? Right, I think that's easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, that was it. I didn't have a dream to go and make records. I think for a lot or of I just thought, man, I'm getting away with something. Yeah, I think for a lot of people too, the idea of a dream is like, it may not even be, it's like saying, I want to go to the moon. To oh, be yeah. Johnny Cash is like, I want to go to the moon. It's yeah. like not achievable, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to be, I didn't, I didn't even think about having a, a record out, let alone being a recording artist, let alone touring the country. Right. You know, I don't think I was really ready for all that. You know, I mean, I would have, I was having such a good time with that thousand bucks in cash and singing for my friends, yeah. you know, 80, 100 people at a time. I could have very well done that for a couple of years and um, I could have gotten a big mountain of songs done, you know, but anyway, things happened like they did, and I'm, I'm not complaining, you know, so it, it's something, it all so happened, that, but I could have stayed that way for a while, right. personally, so that, as far as you said, did I have a dream, you know, I thought people, actually, I thought show business and the whole world of it was so far away removed from where I was, yeah. I thought you had to either be from France, or you had to be a rich kid to be... Right. Those were the people you saw on TV. There weren't people like me. Not a kid who was in the service. Right. Right. Who was part of that war? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, it was a. It was a. It was like you say. Like, like you might as well, you know, think about being on the moon. You know, walking on the moon. And no matter how far one's life goes, you're always going to be that guy, right? So it's no, pretty much. So whatever success you're going to have, however many people like what you do. I'm imagine you're never really not going to be the guy who didn't plan on this, right? Right. Yeah. So that's going to always be part of your edge or part of your story and your songwriting. Yeah, yeah. It stays that way. Yeah. You know. Um, I didn't get too jaded through that. I mean, I've been doing it 45 years. Yeah. I'm pretty much the guy that I was when I started out, except for <clears throat> when I listened to that first batch of songs I did on the record where I'm sitting on a bale of hay. Yeah. There's a certain, as, even though the songs are about some heavy subjects, there's an innocence there mm -hmm. that never, that once I became a recording artist, boom, like that was it, you're cut free kid. This it. is it, you know, you're out there. Like you could never retain that sort of the bit of innocence that I wrote those original songs with. You know, so you don't try, at least I don't. You don't want to, you can't try and get back to something that you can't be no more. Right. You know, you just become what you are, you know, day by day. You know, how you treat other people and how they treat you. That's who you are, to so, me. And so how, but but that innocence is part of the real glory of the songwriting, right? It is, but and you can't regain that. No, so... so Once you cut loose, you cut loose, you just float out here like there's no gravity out here, you know? Is that scary? Was well, that no, scary? No, 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 it's life, you know? <laughs> It was yeah. like now, but yeah, when you're 24, is it like? Flo everybody floats around, yeah. yeah that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you just don't bump into each other, that's all. Right. Yeah. Were you good at it, navigating it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to be really good before I did all this, before I made records and stuff. I could go into a room full of people and I could be right in the center of it and hide. I could be, I could just shut down. Nobody would know whether I was in that room or not. Right. You know, and I love that, because I could always be an observer. I could look around and see how people were and how they treat each other and what's going on. It's like a story, living in a story. So it wasn't shyness? It wasn't that? Mm -mm, that uh, I could be shy, or I could go and be the life of the party, yeah. you know? But it was, um, I just I just preferred to observe rather than take part, you know? Unless there were, there were people I really liked, you know? And I'd, take part in, and be more active you right. know, in the conversation. But I could go into a room, literally, I'd go to a party and just make myself invisible. You know, and I guess that was part of my writing uh, at first, to be able to do that. So when you became more well-known, it's harder for you to do that because people want to talk to you. Yeah, they, they want to talk to the shy kid in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you adjust to that? 
Yeah, you know, it was still tough. It was tough for me to think that people knew me that never met me. They think they knew me because they listened to my record. And that that's just one part of me, you know. So that was kind of odd to me. It took me a while to get used to that. But I did find over the years that when you meet somebody um, doing this, whether it's a, a fan or, or somebody you just meet, you know, just like doing this, um, they if you got if you help them and not be so nervous, then you, it's up to me, in other words, to take the situation and make it like let's just have a good time, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how I learned that. I think I just learned it from. It used to make me so nervous to meet new people and get off a plane and have a bunch of people think they know me and. It, that was all goofy to me, but once I found out that I could kind of change the, the whole thing, the temperature, the whole situation, then it was all right. Did you have, for lack of a better term, a mentor? Did you have somebody who you could look at and say, that cast The closest right? I ever had to a mentor was uh, about 20 years into doing all this. I met Jack Clement in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, that was actually about 10 years into it. And Jack was the first one that totally, he was the first songwriter, producer, person that totally captured my imagination. I'm not talking about looking up to somebody like, like Chris Robertson. Yeah. That was different. Chris was a hero to me. Yeah. But a mentor was somebody, he, he totally, my mind just flies around all day and, and it's hard for me to concentrate on one, on one thing, but if a person can get my attention, mm -hmm. Like he did, he just took, he got my total attention because his house was a total circus. Jack was the ringmaster. Yeah. And I was just, a, I felt like a kid that peeked under the circus tent. And I was just totally taken by it, you know. Just like great music, great parties, yeah. great fun. He was yeah. the first guy that ever took uh, any interest in me singing. Like, you know, to be a better singer. Yeah. You know, without walking around the house and singing opera or anything, just, just be friends with the microphone instead of, he, he noticed that I'd look at the microphone like I was scared of it, you know, so he taught me to look like, you spend a lot of time with that microphone out there doing shows. Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, make friends with it. And um, I listened to, to him. That was the whole thing. I don't listen to a lot of people, you know. Have you got to be the person who has taken on that role now? Where this whole group of people come up behind you? And no, I can't you know? do that. No, if you ask me for advice, I have to make it up. You, know? <laughs> you just lie to them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know shit. Yeah. Some guys pumping gas, going, about... "Fuck that, Prime! You gave me the wrong advice." Yeah, I don't That's know. That's what somebody said. I, I don't know anymore about songwriting than I did uh, yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah, but you know what a, sound, a good song sounds like. But it feels I like do. It. Yeah. it needs a melody. I know when it's done. Yeah, I know when it needs a bridge. Yeah. I'm a great bridge maker. Yeah, I noticed that. Like when I co-write with other people, I can go, "Hang on, I got a bridge for you." You know, <laughs> that just comes natural. You know, I know what a bridge is for. You know, you have to get away from the song, All right? So, so you can go back to it. You know, because it's such a pretty song, you need to get away and come back. Do you think people are born with that, or is it? I don't know. It's the kind of knack you got. You yeah. know, after, after you take an engine apart so many times, you know, you can maybe build a bigger, bigger carburetor. Yeah. What's your best song you ever wrote about a car? About a car? Yeah, I know you love them. Automobile. Yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. Yeah, Brad's getting married in the springtime. Will is getting married in the fall. I got married in high school. I really got married at all. I've been driving my automobile <laughs> all around this world. Yeah, That's awesome. I love driving. Yeah. I can write behind the steering wheel better than the guitar. Really? And you don't have to keep it in tune either. <laughs> <laughs> so you just drive, right, driving down the road humming driving, yeah? Yeah, humming and thinking and, you know, I had a, a 51 Ford with a flathead engine and that engine sounded so sweet, I turned the radio off, I wouldn't have no music. I just listened to that engine pull me down the road and, and uh, it's a great thing. That's your place? Yeah. So you, you couldn't write a song on a hybrid? It's making or an electric no, car. No, the first time I got in a hybrid, I wanted to jump out. <laughs> I mean, who wants a high wide pulling me down the street? You know, that's crazy. Better for the environment, uh, uh, but it's yeah. not inspiring you, right? Really? I mean, I'll just to, I'll just to say clean air, <laughs> for God's sake. You know? <laughs> Do you think, is it the car that, like, when you were, say, 10 or 11, 
you know, you know, the older kids or the men were driving cars and the moms driving cars, did it represent something to you? Is it, do you think that's where that connection came from? Um, I don't know. The freedom, the open road? I don't know. I just, I mean, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, when I was 11 years old, that's when rock and roll was invented. Mm -hmm. And that's when they were making the best cars ever. So I had to think that rock and roll had something to do with the guys in yeah. Detroit that were designing cars that looked absolutely fabulous. Well, I, I remember Delta going, 88, right? You know, yeah. singing about cars right from the very <laughs> beginning. Yeah. yeah. I remember going to a museum in Chicago and they had the world's safest car, right? <laughs> this is in the 50s. Yeah. It looks exactly like all the cars that you can't tell. Like you can't tell a car, one car from another right, right now. And that's the, word, the way the world's safest car looked. It, it was just a no, no, no looking car, you know. No style. I can remember it. sitting on my front porch and I could tell you by headlights and taillights. I could tell you that's a 53 Plymouth. Right. That's a 59 Cadillac. I mean, they all look like something. So it's got to do with music. If the music was better, the cars would be better looking. You think so? Yes, bad pop music makes bad cars. I makes, agree with you. I'm, I'm on, I'm on yeah. that, really? Yeah, makes bored teenagers, high crime. I mean, oh, come on, make some good rock and roll. Yeah. See, give me something to drive. I would love to buy a car with a warranty. Yeah. All the cars I buy are falling apart. Yeah. But they look gorgeous, you know? <laughs> because the rock and roll was great at that time. Right. The pop music was yeah. great at that time. Music makes the car, right. makes the person. So there's a lot of people to blame then for the shitty cars. There, there is. I mean, but who wants well, to... That's the mentor role you can take. That's how you can give advice about songwriting. Make better cars. Make better cars. Yeah. That's it. I wonder if they'll know where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> I have to hide the body. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, your new red car that you got, right? You're right. 77 Coupe de Ville. Right. Yeah. But She's a beauty. You know, they say four cats is the limit. That you can have, can't have can have more than four cats. How many Cadillacs is too many Cadillacs for one person? I have six motorcycles, so I'm the wrong guy to ask the question, but I'm asking anyway because your wife's looking at me and <laughs> your manager's looking at me. There's no such thing as too many Cadillacs. Right. As long as you, you can only drive one at a time, but ain't, they're nice. They look so good, you know. Um, I don't, I'm not talking about the new ones. No. I don't personally like the new Cadillacs. You know, I just wish they'd make a car, any car, that would make me want to get out of bed in the morning and run and buy one. Yeah. I would find a way to pay for it. You know, but they're, they're ugly. Is, it, is t Elon Musk taking you in a Tesla yet? Yeah, I saw, I went to a Tesla dealership yeah. in Colorado about six years ago. They're all right, but I mean, you know, I don't want to drive something that looks like the Jetsons. You know, I want a good looking car. I guess it's not his fault, it's the musician's fault of the day. It is too. Um, that's who I'm blaming directly. The big part of what you what you were a part of, whether or not you wanted to be, was counterculture, right? This idea of youth being counterculture. And for a long time, there's many people who think that counterculture isn't really there because whatever's mainstream, you know, moms and kids like the same music, dads and kids like the same music. Who are you rebelling against, really? You know, there's this strange political divide where no matter how well, my parents listen to good music, they yeah. listen. They were good country fans and. Country in the 50s was a, uh, there was a fine line between rockabilly and country and yeah. rock and roll. And some country songs that would start out country would go to the top of the pop charts and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I mean. It was, I think, things were all good. Cards were good. Music was good. <laughs> Girls were good. Boys were good. Yeah. It was really good. Were you playing, um, were you playing music for your, 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 your parents when you were young? When you started writing, my brother right? told me I played when I was fourteen. Yeah. He was teaching himself how to play the fiddle, and he needed a rhythm guitar player. Is it your brother that you're singing about on this record? My brother Dave. Yeah. No, that that, that was, was uh, Dave's still here. Yeah. D Doug uh, is departing. Yeah. D Doug left us about five years ago. He was uh, Doug was five years older than me, and mm -hmm. Dave is ten years older than me. And Dave's the one that taught me how to play. Yeah. Doug's the one that taught me how to rebel. Doug was the original rebel without a cause. Yeah. <laughs> he quit high school when he was 15, joined the Air Force, and he, Doug, uh, you know, he riding around on motorcycles when he was 14, and wore engineer boots, had a tattoo, and, yeah. and he was, uh, he was something. That's a really beautiful part of the record is when you start talking about who you miss and why. Oh, yeah. It's a really beautiful part of the record. And Thank the, you. And you're empowering ants, and you're just, it's just this, like I was listening to it thinking, 
you know, there's a guy who's thought about his family for a long time, and this, well, because you let yourself be vulnerable too. Oh, we had a great. Uh, we were lucky. My mother and her sisters started back in 1963 having a reunion, so you would know your cousins. You know, I, I see a lot of families. People are <laughs> looking up their family tree. They don't even know one of their cousins. Yeah. They don't know what happened to their family. I know where all my family is, even though they, they move around the country. Mm -hmm. You know, because part of us get together every year on Labor Day weekend. We get together in Kentucky. And so it's good. And then I'm able to travel around, so I get to see all the relatives more mm -hmm. than the other ones do, you know, because right. they come to the shows. So it's pretty neat. And you like having them back there with you? I do. Yeah. You know, that's family. So, like, when you're 81 and 91, I saw Othar Turner play in Memphis when he was 92 years old. Oh, yeah. And, and Honey Boy Edwards at 92. At 92, are you still touring around playing records? I'm hoping I'm on vacation by then. <laughs> yeah. But in Ireland at that point? I'm hoping they're making a really nice new Cadillac. And yeah, Ireland would be a great place. Mm -hmm. Fiona and I were talking on the way over here. We loved it. Lived by the ocean for three months. That's pretty good. You know, yeah, we're just we're putting the word out there. Anybody's got a house on the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Wants John Pride and his wife to stay there. Well, this is only ten minutes from the ocean. You can always stay here if you want, but it's okay. a different ocean. Wait, so you have you had ten boxes of songs or and, and lyrics, and there are only ten songs on this. You no, know, it's well, yeah. yeah, it wasn't. They weren't fully formed songs. But no doubt, it was just enough to. Uh, I doubt if many of the songs came from what was in that box. Right. But what was in that box was enough to jar stuff right. loose that that I didn't know. I didn't know. I just needed a push, you know, to get to get those songs out of me. You got more songs in you? You think? Oh sure, probably. If you're taking an autopsy, I probably got 120 in there. <laughs> well, that's 10 more records, man. Yeah. 12 more records. <laughs> so you better get at it. Yeah, but the autopsy might kill me. <laughs> <laughs> probably would. <laughs> It's a pleasure to see you. Thanks for coming in, man. Hey, thanks a lot. Good, good talking to you. No, Thank likewise. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you.